AquarianRadio.com. Aloha. This is Enki. You know me as Aquarius. And this is our age, the Sata Yuga. Time to celebrate with us. We have programs on all chakra tantra, love styles and relationship choices, counseling strategies and techniques that you can use at home. We have extraterrestrial radio where we deal with alienology, paranormal people, and we have an experiencers network. We have a section called Ancient Aliens, and the programs therein are Enki Speaks, Nimma, the mother of humanity, has her program, and we revise ancient anthropology. And most important of all, we have Peace Paradigms because this is the age of peace. Harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding. No more falsehoods or derisions. Golden living dreams of visions, mystic crystal revelations, and the mind's true liberation. This is empty. It is I who 300,000 years ago created your race, and 200,000 years ago, it was a lot of fun, made it even better with some of the pretty girls. And it is I who saved you from the flood, and it is I and my beloved Nimma and my son Ningashiga Thoth who are here to help you overcome my runaway son Marduk or Allah, my brother Enlil or Yahweh. And free yourself from all the supposed gods and recognize your own great potential. You have much to teach us. And we, Anunnaki, those of us from Nibiru, welcome full partnership. And here are your hosts, Janet and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Aloha, everybody, and welcome to Aquarian Radio at AquarianRadio.com. This is the Aquarian Talk Radio Network. I'm your host, Janet Carolesson, the bearer of NIMA Consciousness, and my co-host is Dr. Sasha Lesson, a Ph.D. anthropologist with a, his Ph.D. from UCLA. Great. Today's show is an episode of Enki Speaks, and we haven't quite decided what to call it yet, but what we're going to do is tell you the basic story of the uh, people from the planet Nibiru who uh, came to Earth 450,000 years ago. We're going to look at the evidence, which is overwhelming, that they uh, did indeed come and they were extraterrestrials. And we'll finish off with an ancient love story. And uh, we'll have a title for it. I hope a snappy one. The title of our book is Anunnaki, Gods No More, Unmasking Technologically Advanced Gold Miners from the Planet Nibiru Who Posed as Divine. Today we share what we've learned and why it's important. Long lived, I mean we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years ago, extraterrestrial homo sapien giants, I mean they were 8 to 12 feet tall, came from the planet Nibiru to Earth. They came to Earth and they mined gold here around 400,000 years ago. 300,000 years ago they created Earth adapted short lived mine slaves, that's us, from their genome. We called them Anunnaki, which means people from the sky. They taught us hierarchy, one-upsmanship, violence, greed, slavery, and debt. These Anunnaki made us worship them and call them gods. 200,000 years ago, their chief scientist, a guy named Enki, begat his own line of earthlings, and he raised them up. He exalted them. He begat Noah with a, a chick named Batanash who was his earthling lover in 11,000 B.C. After Noah's flood, the Anunnaki ruled through the sons of Noah and the, their descendants. Well, at, the Anunnaki ruined their whole eastern Mediterranean area, the cities they had, with nuclear blasts and fall, fallout storms. And, and most of these Anunnaki, these guys from Nibiru, uh, returned to that planet, but some stayed. And they and their descendants are the power elite that rule us to this very day. So today we'd like to share the evidence that supports this history. And we have checked on all these different hypotheses to see which makes the most accurate predictions in terms of evidence. So let me tell you uh, of just a bit of the overwhelming documentation that supports the Sitchin hypothesis. One collection of evidence is Sumerian space maps. 
The Sumerians printed clay tablets that showed planets beyond normal eyesight. They displayed rocket route maps and verbal descriptions. They say the gods dictated of planets and their orbits beyond eye range. The dark, the dark dwarf star Nemesis orbit plus the orbit of the Nibiran planetary complex brings Nibiru from some 1,000 astronomical units away to the vicinity of Earth on a 30-degree plane to Earth's orbit, and it comes between Mars and Jupiter. This view of the Earth from the outer planets of the inner solar system to the inner gave Nibirans um, the they could see the orbits of our planetary system. Nibiru acted as a spacecraft that sailed past all the other planets, giving and gave them a chance at repeated close looks. They labeled the inner planets from the farthest from the sun, Pluto, to the closest, Mercury, from 1 to 12, and Earth is 7, counting the sun and Earth's moon as planets. Hence, Sitchin's title of his book, the first book in this series, called The Twelfth Planet. Sumerians lacked telescopes and couldn't see Uranus's, Uranus's and Neptune's orbits and the, the route that the maps show. Nibiran dictated maps uh, proving that they had astronomical information Sumerians on their own didn't. The maps accurately detailed the Earth from space, a perspective impossible for ancient Sumerians to have on their own. Sumerians began the list of the solar system, and let's look at this, from the most distant from the sun and the ones way beyond what uh, people could just see. So Nibiru is the most distant, then there's Pluto, then there's Neptune, and Neptune was only found by modern astronomers in uh, 1846, So, and here these ancient Sumerians are, are recording this from uh, seven, 8,000 years ago. Uh, and the same with Uranus. They, they, uh, the Sumerians said it was there. The gods told them, and we only discovered it in 1781 A, uh, uh, A.D. The uh, Sumerians uh, as then are listing the planets as they come in. Uh, there's Saturn, and there's Jupiter, Earth, uh, Mars, Earth, and then Earth's moon. And they, they counted Earth's moon in their counting as a planet. The last uh, list was uh, Venus and then Mercury, which was the ones closest to Solaris. So that's how come they got this list in the direction it went. And, uh, th yeah, so what's the next evidence for uh, uh, Sitchin's Sumerian version of history, Janet? The Sumerians wrote that the Nibirans told them of the planets beyond unassisted human vision. The sequence of planets the Nibirans listed reflected their experience when it came to Earth from Nibiru from beyond the inner solar system towards the sun. Their sequence, therefore, adds to the evidence that the Nibirans were indeed extraterrestrial astronauts. So what's... Yeah, that was a repeat of the, of the last paragraph. I, I forgot to cancel. Okay. You're supposed to read up here on this so page. I'll go to this page. Well, ask the question again. Okay. So um, what we wanted, we're looking at the different kinds of evidence that would, uh, this stuff that the Sumerians said, the gods told them, was true or not. And first we, we said, well, they have all these uh, pictures and drawings and uh, of, of planets they couldn't possibly have seen. And uh, they're in, an, and so that's the first set of evidence. Now we're looking at what other evidence do we have? So they had uh, clay tablets, and uh, the ET god said they saw, and we much later confirmed, water on the planets and the moons. And the clay tablets from Sumer says that Mars had water. They showed water on asteroids, comets, on Neptune, Uranus, Venus, Saturn, Jupiter the rings of Saturn and on Saturn's and Jupiter's moons. Our astronomers recently confirmed water where Sumerian scribes said that Mars once had surface water several meters deep over the whole planet. And that's there's enough water in Mars' crust, Mars's crust, to flood the planet 1,000 miles deep. Martian canyons have flowing water below the dry riverbeds. Mars, Venus, and Earth confirm Sumerian texts of water flowing below the firmament on inner planets. As for Uranus, our scientists only recently validated water on Uranus. Sumerian scribes long ago said, Nibiran said, water covered Uranus. Before Voyager 2 proved otherwise, our astronomers dismissed the Sumerian myth of water on Uranus. They thought Uranus was made of gas only. But Voyager 2 showed Uranus 
un- is covered with a 6,000 mile labor layer of superheated water. And now regarding Neptune, Sumerian scribes wrote on uh, on uh, that that Nibiran gold mine. Yeah, Nibiran gold miners marked the orbit, water surface, and swamp vegetation on Neptune, three billion miles from Earth, long before Leverrier and Galley discovered Neptune in 1846. When the wobbles in Uranus's orbit closer to Earth than Neptune, argued another celestial body lay beyond it. So before Voyager 2 showed Neptune's floating Surrey mixture of ice water, Sitchin published Sumerian Sumerian records of Neptune as a blue-green watery with patches of swamp-like vegetation. So you you get it, basically. The Sumerians said there's water all over these planets, the ones we can see and even the ones we can't see. And it took a few thousand years, and we're just now discovering it. So again, this is evidence that uh, however, whatever the explanation they have, the fact that their explanation predicted that there would be water in these places turns out, when we get more evidence, to be true. Also, the, Nib- the Nibirans had information about the moon way, way before our modern uh, scientists got them. Scholars dismissed as myths Sumerian tales that there was moons on other p- outer planets. <laughs> you know, they, they are, the scholars in the 18th century didn't believe that stuff. But the Sumerians said that the Anunnaki... These gods, these ETs, actually saw the moons that were circling Mars. They saw the moons on Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In 1610 uh, AD, Galileo finally saw four of Jupiter's moons. Before that, it was, quote, unthinkable for a, stu- for a celestial body to have more than one moon since Earth just had one. That's how people in those days reasoned. Mars has two moons. Jupiter has more than 16 moons, and Saturn has more than 21. Uranus has up to 15, and there's eight moons around Neptune. Uh, What the Sumerians said about the outer planet's moons supports the hypothesis that they saw, that the Anunnaki saw these moons from beyond the inner solar system. And the Barons also got the asteroid, asteroid makeup right uh, first, also, too. The Barons described the asteroids as pieces of Earth knocked into space when four billion years ago a moon of Nibiru struck Tiamat. Debris from the lower half of Tiamat stretched into space. Sumerian text and the biblical version thereof said the asteroid belt, a bracelet of debris, orbited the sun between Jupiter and Mars. But our astronomers were not aware of that until 1801 when Piazzi found the first asteroid series. It's taken modern, modern astronomy centuries to find out what Sumerians knew 6,000 so, years ago. So you've got to understand how important this is. Now, their explanation about how this came about, that, the, that uh, Earth is where it is and where the asteroid belt is, is that uh, 4.5 billion years ago, uh, uh, billion, I say, Nibiru came through this system and one of its moons, and then Nibiru itself hit this planet that was between Mars and Jupiter called Tiamat. And it knocked half of it into asteroids, and there they still circle between uh, Jupiter and Mars. And it knocked the other half, boom, of this planet Tiamat down into uh, its present orbit between uh, Mars and Venus. That's where we are now, and that's modern Earth. So this is uh, whether or not it happened the way uh, they said, one hypothesis would be, if that's so, that means the asteroid should be made of the same stuff as Earth. And what happened when we got up there? It is. Okay, so where are we? You're okay, so the Sumerian uh, also story also predicted modern findings of Earth's makeup and history. And this powerfully supports the validity of the Anunnaki hypothesis. The Anunnaki told the Sumerians that Earth's crust, plate tectonics and differences between continental and oceanic crusts uh, caused the emergence uh, of Pangaea from under the waters and the primordial encircling ocean. The findings of modern science corroborate this ancient picture. After the collisions that created Earth out of Tiamat, Earth evolved into an independent planet and it got the shape of a globe because gravity does that as it, it goes round. Waters gathered into the cavity on the torn-off side. Dry land appeared on the other side of Earth. 
Earth's crust, you can tell, is only 12 to 45 miles thick. Uh, and and uh, this is in the parts that uh, this is brought there by uh, sediment and volcanoes. But the average elevation of continents, uh, how thick the crust is there, is way, way, way thicker. And uh, in the in specific, it's seven, uh, it's, it, there's a, like a, a seven mile gouge. Anyway, there's tw- it's huge. There's a gouge, and that's where the waters went, and that's the, uh, in the Pacific Basin. And the crust that's on top of the uh, Pacific uh, uh, Ocean, uh, underneath the ocean, but on top of the Earth, is just from sand that gets washed in in volcanoes, not from the original crust that's er- on the continents. So we're looking at the evidence. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Nibirans and the earthlings share DNA. So let me give you some background for this. Around 300,000 years ago, the Nibirans on Earth uh, and the Anunnaki built four centers in Sumer, a spaceport, mission control complex, a med center, and a metallurgy center. Submersible boats took gold from the southeast, from southeast Africa to the metallurgy center where techno- technicians processed the gold into bars, the Anunnaki commander Enlo built a communication chamber with telescopes on a broadcasting tower. And the Anunnaki chief scientist Enki instigated the mutiny among the Nibirans working in the gold mines in Africa. And he said, add homo erectus genes to the Nibirian genome and uh, to make mine slaves. Enki, Negashida, and Nima at Enki's leg and gr- lab in Great Zimbabwe adapted their genome to create us, the slave species, to work the mines. They added clay, copper, and a few Homo erectus genes to adapt their DNA and mitochondrial DNA structure to Earth. At first, the genetics team used Anunnaki surrogates, surrogate mothers, as incubator wombs. And 200,000 years ago, Enki coupled with two slave girls, and one of them bore a male child, a DAPA, and the other bore a girl child, Titi, and then Adapa and Titi begat uh, more humans, Cain and Abel. And lots more, too, after that. And lots that. more. So uh, another uh, type of evidence that we have that these uh, Nibirians were here and uh, they had a lot of knowledge and it wasn't just a myth is that they, they got how genomes worked way before our scientists uh, did, long before our scientists had any idea the Nibirians knew uh, that the sequence of organisms that had been introduced probably by uh, uh, interventionism onto onto Earth by terraformers. More than 300,000 years ago, in any case, the Anunnaki decoded the universal human genome. They isolated their own genome. They isolated the genomes of various animals. They isolated the genome of Homo erectus. They uh, were able to find both the DNA and the mitochondrial DNA and how these sequenced. Enki's symbol, which is entwined serpents, is the structure of the genetic code. And this is the knowledge that let Enki create Adam and then grant Adam and Eve the power to procreate. Enki built a a sterile lab and the air conditioning in Enki's lab in Greater Zimbabwe is the source of the biblical assertion that having fashioned Adam, Elohim, blew in his nostrils the breath of life. You know, just picture a lab and they've got an oxygen thing on a, on a baby, just like we have right nowadays. Enki, Nima, and Negashina mapped chromosomes, genes, and genomes, and they fertilized ova in test tubes, flasks, test tube flasks with sperm soaked in Nibirian blood serum and mineral nutrients. They experimented with cloning, cell fusion, and recombinant recombinant, recombinant technology, cutting DNA strands with enzymes, targeted viruses, absorbing sperm and genetic material to be used for fertilization, and splicing in DNA patches of other species to create, at first, hybrids that were unable to reproduce. Then, Negashina isolated the XX and XY chromosomes that allowed the creation of, of fertile um, 
allow these creatures to be fertile and be able to reproduce. Yes. So they, they were way ahead of us. And so the, the things they said aren't silly myths uh, uh, or anything of the sort. They were scientists, and our scientists are just now catching up with them. Uh, another uh, type of evidence that uh, we have, uh, as I alluded to earlier, is that, yes, we ha- they had a map, an accurate, accurate map of the land underneath the, what, what we see now is the Antarctic uh, ice cap. 13,000 years ago, the Ice Age abruptly ended, and Antarctica was freed of its ice cover. Its coasts, bays, and rivers were seen. Now, the Nibirian, Nibirian gold mining uh, expedition personnel saw this from their orbiting spacecraft. They saw what happened. Our ancestors, the immediate ancestors, uh, didn't even know that the Antarctic continent existed. Uh, in A.D. 1820, British and Russian sailors <laughs> discovered Antarctica that it was even there. It was then, as now, in 1820, it was covered by the ice that we see now, uh, and we can only see under it with our radar. Yet, uh, um, in 1958, Antarctica appears on world maps ice-free and has appeared since the 14th century AD, hundreds of years before we so-called discovered it. Map makers of the age of discovery stated that their sources were ancient maps from Mesopotamia. So, you know, the Anunnaki gave them this information, and at least that's the best hypothesis around. Okay. And another piece of evidence. ETs left uh, the extraterrestrial, the, the Anunnaki left huge doodles and rocket takeoff lines uh, this is the plains of Nazca and other places. The evidence of the last Nibiran spaceport on Earth in- includes a 740 uh, includes 740 takeoff trails atop a huge scaped drawings geoglyphs of known and imaginary animals and birds made by removing the topsoil several inches down, executed with one continuous line that curves and twists without crossing over itself. Attempts to show that a horde of ber- workers working at ground level and using scrapers could have created these images has failed. Obviously, someone airborne used a soil blasting device to doodle on the ground below. The feet deep candelabra in nearby Bay of Paracas was obtained in the same way by aircraft equipped with a ray gun. These were incredible artists. <laughs> Nibiran pilots used the Nazca flat lands in their final spaceport, doodling for a while while killing time before taking off. Are you on the right still page? You. Oh, still me. In addition to the jiglis, there are actual lines, the Nazca lines, that run straight without fault. These stretch, sometimes narrow, sometimes wide, sometimes short, sometimes long, over hills and vales, no matter the shape of the terrain. The straight lines crisscross each other, sometimes running over and ignoring the animal drawings. These are not made with hand-held ray guns. The lines are not horizontally level. They run straight over uneven terrain, ignoring hills, ravines, gullies. They are not runways. They are the result of takeoffs by craft taking off and leaving on the ground below lines created by their engine's exhaust. On a modern mountain, lines of grooves outline a landing corridor. Circles and squares form a cross, as in a modern heliport. And these things are only seen in full from the air. This is a nearby mountain uh, that that you have these uh, doodles and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another type of evidence is the rocket, the actual rocket images, descriptions, as well as the route maps and calculation. Ancient engravings show spaceports, rockets, launch towers, helicopters, flying saucers. There's accounts in the ancient literature of takeoffs, landings, journeys. There's the uh, big story about the rocket and airplane journeys of Anu, of Enlil, of Enki, Ea. Uh, as he's sometimes called, Anzu, Marduk, and Inanna, lots and lots of these stories in the ancient uh, literature in uh, clay tablets. We see relief sculptures of a helicopter, two airplanes, Zia Sutras submersible on an ancient uh, uh, frieze, which is 25 feet above the floor on uh, the temple in Abydos in Egypt. A drawing from Anu's temple in Ur shows a multi-stage rocket atop which rests a command cabin. 
There's engines at the bottom, and you can see EGG astronauts inside this multi-stage ro rocket. Uh, there's a very famous Phoenician coin from Gabal, Lebanon, which shows the launch tower. There's Hittite glyphs that show cruising missiles and rockets mounted on launch pads that have got inside a radiating chamber. Well, of course, academic uh, anthropologists and Egyptologists don't want to uh, ad admit that we were assisted by ETs, and so uh, and so this stuff is written off as, as just myths. And where in the world did these guys ever imagine a helicopter when they haven't been invented yet? <laughs> And Nibirans on Earth had craft that could appear over place, hover for a while, and disappear from sight again. Ezekiel on the banks of Kalbar in northern Mesopotamia reported a helicopter consisting of a cabin resting on four posts, each equipped with rotary, rotary wings, and he called it a whirlbird. A seal found in Crete, dated to the 13th century, depicts a rocket ship moving in the skies, above cart and propelled by flames escaping from its rear. Earthlings saw rockets and jets as fire-breathing jet dragons. The Epic of Gilgamesh just details an ancient account of launching a rocket. First, the tremendous thud as the rocket engines ignited. The heavens shrieked. Accompanied by the shaking of the ground, the earth boomed. Clouds of smoke and dust enveloped the Sinai spaceport, the launching site, and daylight failed, darkness came. Then the brilliance of the ignited engines showed through. Lightning flashed. As the rocket began to climb skyway, skyward, a flame shot up. The cloud of dust and debris swelled in all directions. Then as it began to fall down, it rained death. Now the rocket was high in the sky, streaking heavenward. The glow van vanished. The fire went out. And the rocket was gone from sight. And the debris that had fallen had turned to ashes. Turning from the rocket evidence for the Anunnaki, what evidence do we get from architecture? Well, the Nibirans moved heavier stones than we can even now. Our science still can't cut, move, and fit huge rocks as well as the Nibirans did, this Anunnaki. They cut stones as large as 10 tons with huge cutting tools run on power which they pulled from the earth and capacitated and amplified by crystals that broadcast energy from their pyramids, such as the Great Pyramid in Giza and Enki's Pyramids in South Africa. They also used white powder of monoatomic gold to lighten the iron-laden, magnetically charged stones for transport to the construction sites. The chief Nibiran architect, Ningishida, planned and the earthlings built the gigantic astro-navigational landmark pyramid at, and the Sphinx at Giza. Nibirans made spaceports at Sippar in Iraq, then on the Sinai Peninsula, and the Nazca Plateau in Peru. Ningashida directed Lagash's King Gudea, who built a temple for Ninurta. The Nibirans used their know-how and earthling labor to build rocket silos and airplane hangars in the cities and temple complexes of ancient Sumer. Enlil designed a huge temple for Solomon in Jerusalem, and he followed the same design for the landing platform as the design he had used when he made the landing platform at Baalbek in Lebanon. In Mexico, Ningashida with Sumerian overseers and Olmec foremen, these are uh, uh, Africans, and Indian laborers built Teotihuacan. In Yucatan, they uh, built at uh, Palenque, Tikal, Uxmal, and several other places uh, huge stepped stone temples, just like the ones in Sumer. In South America, Ningashida and his uncle Adad directed, and he was known there as Viracocha, they directed the construction of Mochica, Chan Chan, Cusco, Machu Pico, Picho, Chaven, Oyande Tambu, and the Baalbek of the New World, a metallurgical temple and observatory complex at Tiwanaku, that's in Peru. On Mars, the Nibirans manned a spaceport and they lasered a monument to one of their kings. How about, Janet, you tell us about the landing platform at Lebanon because it's spectacular. Okay, so I'm right here, right? Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Nibirans built a launch tower at Baalbek, Lebanon, for the gold mining expedition on a vast hor horizontal platform. 
artificially created 4,000 feet above sea level, surrounded by a wall. The enclosed squarish area was 2,500 feet long, over 5 million square feet built before the flood some 13,000 years ago. It was held together without mortar, rising stage after stage to incredible heights, placed on a vast stone platform. The massive stones formed an enclosure that surrounded a cavity, a hollow within which stood the rocket about to be launched. The encompassing walls were multi-leveled, rising in stages to enable servicing the rocket ship, its payload, and a command module. Arriving rocket ships landed on the vast stone platform adjoining the launch tower, then would be put in place, as had been done to the colossal stone blocks, within the massive stone enclosure ready for launching. Baalbek included stone blocks of incredible size, precisely cut and placed, including three colossal stone blocks that are the largest in the world, the trial... Trilithon. 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 The stone blocks that make up the Trilithon weigh more than 1,100 tons each and are placed upon older, immense stone blocks over 60 feet long with sides of 14 to 12 feet cut to have a slanting face that weigh 500 town tons each there is even now no man-made machine no crane vehicle or mechanism that can lift such a weight of 1000 to 1200 tons 1200 tons to say nothing of carrying such an immense object over valleys and mountainsides and placing each slab in its precise position many feet above the ground. There are no traces of any roadway, causeway, ramp, or other earthworks that could suggest hauling these megaliths from their quarry several miles away. The stone blocks that comprise the platform are so tightly put together that no one has been able to penetrate it and study the chambers, tunnels, caverns, and substructures hidden beneath Though Arabs did penetrate a 460 feet long tunnel at the southeast corner of the platform, they proceeded through a long vaulted passage like a railway tunnel under the great, great in total darkness broken by green lights from puzzling laced windows. Nabirans not only lifted and placed such colossal stone blocks, but also carried them from a quarry several miles away. The quarry has been located and in, in it, one of these, those colossal stone blocks had not been yet completed and it still lies partly attached to the native rock. Its size exceeds the trilithion blocks. Trilithon. Trilithon. I don't yeah. know why. So do, do take a look at our, our site. We have uh, you know, pictures, photos of uh, Zechariah Sitchin and his whole group of uh, people. And, and we're only going to be able thing. to have time to go to the bottom of page five and then we will do part two tomorrow. So. Okay, so we'll finish. One more thing about evidence. Another striking evidence of the Anunnaki presidents concerns the nuclear war that they had here on Earth. To this very day, Sinai residues show where the nukes hit. Nuking, which uh, soil analysis actually documents, changed the soil of Sinai in 2024 BC, the year Enki said Nergal and Ninurta bombed there. Sitchin wrote that in 1999, scientists determined that the abrupt climate change uh, depopulated the area, and uh, what they found was place is covered with tephra, the kind of little uh, what's left uh, like you have in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Lot's wife didn't turn to salt. She was vaporized. She was vaporized. By the Anunnaki. <laughs> so we will uh, uh, go. Well, why don't we go down to right here? Okay, because well, this is the end of the evidence oh, that's uh, section. Part of it. If you want to start on the next no, section. We, next we time will. we will. Go ahead. Tell them about next time. Then, well, next time... We're going to go into uh, how Earth was formed and, uh, and what effects that collision had. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the evidence. And um, so that'll be tomorrow. We're going to be doing this show tomorrow. And we look forward to you returning to listen to us as we talk about the evidence of how we know that these Anunnaki Niburans were hanging around the Earth and 
had a major role you know, when you got in our culture. You got a bunch of different ways of explaining the same thing. And what, what uh, in uh, science is interesting to follow what's called Occam's razor. Whatever is the the simplest explanation that accounts for most of the information and doesn't leave a bunch of stuff out and leads you to new predictions that are accurate, uh, either by looking at past data or looking at uh, current data or future predicting future data, then that's a better hypothesis. And so uh, the, the uh, Anunnaki often spoke in anthropomorphic terms, you know, like as planets have wills and so forth, and we don't know whether they have wills or not, but the explanation that they have leads us to predict all kinds of things that are more accurate than our scientists knew uh, 200 years ago. And uh, so if you're going to go and look at some, some new stuff and the Sumerians have said something about it that the gods told them, it's a darn good hypothesis to look uh, and see about that. That's, uh, one thing, for example, they say mercury is a source of lots of gold and, and that uh, meteorites from uh, mercury are what seeded Earth with gold. Well, there you go. There's a hypothesis. Is there or isn't there? Uh, gold on Mercury. Do uh, meteorites from Mercury contain gold or not? And that's a question for tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, tune back in tomorrow. This has been Janet Carolesson and Dr. Sasha Lisson. Aloha.